Good morning, good morning. It's great to be here in London for our first ever Talent Intelligence Summit. So uh, today we're going to talk about the role of LinkedIn in a changing workforce. And there are three themes uh, we want to cover as a result of that. The first, uh, AI and uh, this coming wave of automation. Second is the widening skills gap. And the third is the rise of independent work and the independent worker. So just to go a little bit deeper, we'll start with uh, AI and automation. And according to the McKinsey Global Institute, if you look at some of the top economies in Europe, it's estimated that based on existing technology, this isn't necessarily about the future and science fiction, but based on existing technology, nearly half of all work activities here in the main economies of Europe uh, will be impacted and are susceptible to automation. Now, by susceptible, we're not necessarily saying that these jobs are going to be eliminated or that people are going to be replaced, but they are going to be deeply impacted. And if you were to double click on that further, the kinds of roles that will be most impacted, not surprisingly, are largely middle skill roles. So areas like manufacturing, uh, retail, hospitality, and transportation. But it's not just these middle skills roles that are going to be impacted. It seems like every other day, there's another headline talking about the way in which AI is ultimately going to disrupt white collar jobs as well, banking, accounting, legal, and even HR. So given uh, this wave of coming AI and automation, uh, some fundamental questions are raised. Uh, how will all of us collectively uh, prepare our workforces uh, for the rise of AI and automation? Which jobs within our organizations will be most materially impacted, which jobs will be eliminated, uh, which jobs will be created, and perhaps most importantly, how do we begin to retrain our workforces for the jobs that are and will be, and not just the jobs that once were. And speaking of training, that brings me to the second theme we wanted to cover today, which is the skills gap. Now, some economists would argue that when it comes to the number of available jobs that exist and current unemployment rates and people see how is it possible that so many jobs are available, so many people are looking for work. Well, clearly, they would argue it's not a traditional skills gap. It's nothing more than the natural byproduct of an economic cycle. And as more and more people are incented to find work by virtue of uh, the increase in wages, they'll come in off the sidelines, they'll reskill themselves, and the skills gap will close. But at LinkedIn, we believe to a large extent it's a false debate as to whether or not there's a singular skills gap and where we are in the economic cycle. We believe there are many skills gaps as defined by a supply-demand imbalance for a specific skill in a specific locality at a specific time. And to take uh, Europe as an example, we look at some of the major markets within Europe. Take uh, Amsterdam. So you've got an organization, well-established organization like Bookings.com uh, that's been uh, operating there for some time. Uh, more newly established companies uh, here in Europe in terms of their headquarters, uh, companies like Netflix and Uber, which have selected Amsterdam. And given the increase in mobile engagement and mobile activity, it's not necessarily surprising then that you see a skills gap emerging uh, with regard to demand and supply imbalances with regard to mobile development. So that would be one example. Uh, moving up to Stockholm, uh, you've got companies like Spotify, H&M, that are really rethinking the way in which uh, consumers engage with products and services and the way these activities increasingly are moving digital. And there we see a gap emerging with regard to web programming. And right here in London, uh, you've got uh, core uh, computer programming skills, uh, Perl, Python, Ruby. And given the uh, increasing demand for talent, engineering talent, uh, here in London by companies like Google, Amazon, offline companies like HSBC, we see a skills gap here as well. And we could say the same across Europe. As a matter of fact, you could say the same to a large extent around the world. So if we were to look a little bit more closely at what's happening here, I think there's really three primary reasons uh, for these growing gaps. Uh, one uh, is low supply. So uh, take AI, for example. There are only so many uh, PhDs and AI specialists in the world, and many of them have been hired. So given the increasing demand across virtually all industries for that kind of talent, we see a widening skills gap. 
Uh, second, lack of mobility. Uh, in the United States, for example, uh, in terms of geographic mobility, we're seeing uh, fewer people moving for jobs at any time since World War II. And uh, a similar dynamic is taking place here in Europe uh, by virtue of socioeconomic stratification and also uh, an increasingly challenging regulatory environment uh, that is creating more and more barriers for people to move from country to country. And then lastly, uh, information asymmetry. Uh, you've got people with the requisite skills that don't know where the jobs exist, and you've got hiring managers and recruiters who've got the jobs and don't know where to find the talent. This all begs the question, how can we identify the right kind of person with the, the right skills in the ro right locations at precisely the right time? third theme we want to cover today is the rise of independent work and independent workers. And for today's purposes, we'll define that as freelancers, short-term contractors, and those people participating in the gig economy. So this may surprise some of you, uh, but roughly 90 million people uh, self-identify according to that definition uh, here in some of the major economies, the EU15. Uh, 90 million, that represents roughly one in four members of the workforce here in Europe uh, across those uh, EU 15 countries. And if you ask people whether or not they'd be interested in independent work, this number increases to roughly 140 million people. So clearly, uh, this is a trend. It's a trend that we don't see reversing anytime soon. Really three reasons for this uh, steep increase in the number of people looking for independent work. One is the rise of millennials. This demographic segment is comprised of people ages 18 uh, to 34, and uh, they're coming quickly. As a matter of fact, by the year uh, 2025, the global workforce uh, will see roughly 75% uh, categorized as millennials. And these millennials are looking for greater flexibility, greater autonomy, and uh, a good side hustle when they can find it. Uh, I first learned of the expression side hustle a couple of months ago in preparation for this presentation. And uh, that way I can demonstrate my millennial bona fides, because I am clearly not a millennial at this point, unfortunately for me. Uh, but at any rate, uh, this is a secular trend that is, is not going to be reversing anytime soon amongst these millennials. Uh, second is the growth of online marketplaces. Uh, whether it's Uber, Airbnb, Deliveroo, uh, you've got companies that are increasingly growing f quickly and generating more opportunities uh, for independent workers. But interestingly enough, they only comprise about 15% of that statistic I showed earlier. So as they continue to grow, as these marketplaces continue to grow, you would expect more and more independent work to be taking place. And then lastly, you've got increasing cost effectiveness for companies who find this kind of flexibility and savings to be highly attractive when it makes sense for them. So the rise of independent work uh, really raises the question, how will we identify and recruit those folks that are interested in independent work as opposed to uh, a full-time role? And how do we develop those individuals? How do we retain those individuals? Because they're looking for something different than the traditional opportunity. OK, so uh, three themes in terms of uh, key changes in the global workforce here in the European workforce, uh, AI and automation, widening skills gap, and the rise of independent work and independent workers. And these open-ended questions are somewhat complex. And right now, there's uh, some uncertainty because some of these trends are so new. So you hear a lot of subjective opinions uh, coming to the, the fray when people are having these discussions. And I don't know about you. I'm as gut-driven as the next person, like to make decisions based on instinct. But I also like to utilize data wherever possible. And that's where we believe uh, LinkedIn comes into play here in terms of helping you to answer some of these fundamental questions and develop the right global workforce strategies and do so here in Europe as well. So speaking of LinkedIn, uh, for us it all begins with our mission to connect the world's professionals, to make them more productive and successful. Uh, some have asked uh, since the uh, acquisition of LinkedIn by Microsoft, uh, will we continue to pursue this mission? Has anything changed? And uh, we continue to operate uh, independently, and that's very much by design. And the other thing is how well aligned our mission is 
with Microsoft's mission to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. So Microsoft and LinkedIn trying to accomplish the same thing, the same sense of purpose, coming at it from different perspectives. Uh, LinkedIn obviously through a professional network, Microsoft through software, and increasingly the cloud. And if LinkedIn is more successful, that makes Microsoft more successful. So uh, they are very much uh, doing everything they can, and we are together to accelerate the realization of our mission and our vision. And when it comes to our vision, that's to create economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce. And the way we'll do that, the way this will come to life, is through what we call uh, the economic graph. So we want to digitally map the global economy and do so across six pillars or six dimensions. Uh, we'd like there to ultimately be a profile for every member of the global workforce, north of three billion people in the global workforce. We'd like for there to be a profile for every company in the world. Uh, some would estimate as many as 60 million companies in the world when you include small and medium-sized businesses. Uh, we'd like to have a digital representation for every available job in the world. Some would estimate as many as 20 million jobs can be digitally represented. Uh, digital representation for every skill required to obtain those jobs and with the acquisition a few years back of Linda uh, by LinkedIn, we think we're in a position to not only provide the data that inform people of the skills they need but the coursework as well so we can help close that skills gap, such a fundamental component of this economic graph. Uh, a profile for every uh, university, every vocational training facility or higher educational organization. And then with regard to knowledge, a professional publishing platform that enables every individual, company, and university to share their professionally relevant knowledge when they elect to do so. And then we want to allow capital, all forms of capital, intellectual capital, working capital, human capital, to flow to where it can best be leveraged. And in doing so, our hope is that we can help lift and transform the global economy. So this isn't science fiction. We've been making good progress on this since first articulating this vision uh, roughly five or six years ago. And back then, it was a dream. It was true north. But over time, uh, we realized we had an opportunity to operationalize our vision, not just our mission. And you can see some of the progress we've been making. Uh, over half a billion people have now signed up for LinkedIn, uh, fast approaching nearly 20 million companies on LinkedIn, uh, coming up on 12 million jobs, and we've indexed far more than that on a global basis. And you can see some of the rest of these stats here. Interestingly enough, in terms of knowledge sharing, you can see uh, over 190 billion updates have been viewed on LinkedIn in just the last year alone. So making excellent progress towards the realization of this vision and the manifestation of the economic graph. So some of you might be asking, uh, what's behind this progress? How have we been able to achieve that kind of scale? And uh, it really starts over the last couple of years with the reimagination of our flagship mobile application. Uh, that was followed uh, this past year uh, by doing the same for our desktop experiences and making this a, a far more seamless process in terms of mobile and desktop, uh, enabling our engineers to innovate that much faster and develop for both channels simultaneously. And unsurprisingly, as a result, we've seen a pretty significant reacceleration in total engagement on LinkedIn. Uh, this year, we expect to do uh, well north of 21 billion sessions, and that's up 29% year over year. So uh, very healthy growth on a, a large base. And if we were to double click on that, what you'd see is uh, specific investment and growth happening in a number of areas. Uh, a few highlights worth calling out today. Uh, one is our jobs offering and create the right products and services for the active job seeker. And here you can see examples of how we're increasingly integrating our jobs experience into these flagship experiences, whether that's desktop or mobile. Another example would be the way in which we're thinking about contextual integration, getting the right jobs experience in front of the right member at the right time. Uh, we have established a, a new career hub uh, within the LinkedIn profile on both desktop and mobile. 
And uh, one of the things we recently started to do was ask people about their career interests from within this career hub. Uh, so even if you're not an active job seeker, uh, would you be open to the idea of finding additional work? And as a result of this integration, we've seen a very dramatic increase in the number of open candidates on LinkedIn. That's grown from roughly 3 million to over 10 million in just the last few months alone. So very exciting progress there. And the net byproduct of uh, this innovation with regard to the jobs experience on LinkedIn is that our jobs unique users are up 70% year over year. And that's on a considerable base. So uh, some strong progress on the jobs front. With regard to content, if you're seeking to engage people on a daily basis as we are, content becomes fundamental to that equation. And we've been making strong progress uh, through a lot of investment in our feed experience, uh, becoming more personalized, uh, more relevant, just more valuable uh, to our everyday members. And you can see here uh, an example of one of those innovations that we call Storylines, where our editorial team in conjunction with our data sciences team is able to identify stories that they believe all professionals should be reading on a daily basis, and then curate packages that we call Storylines around uh, these particular subject matters. And you can see uh, we then aggregate stories across publishers, influencers, people within your network who are commenting on these stories and having a lot of success with this launched initially in the U.S. will be coming to Europe soon. And if you miss the stories in your feed, uh, whether using mobile or desktop, that's okay because uh, we've also created uh, what we call the daily rundown. So we'll send out an email and we'll also notify people when we think there's breaking news that's going to be relevant to them. Third area of innovation with regard to our feed has been the recent introduction of a video experience where all of our members, whether they be blue collar workers or influencers, uh, can share via video the things that they're most inspired by, things they're most excited about within their companies. Uh, folks are starting to teach and share coursework. Uh, they're taking videos at events that they're speaking at. But rather than tell you about it, uh, why don't I let our members show you what they're doing with LinkedIn video. Good morning. Good morning. I am excited to be here with Glenn Eagles talking about the future of our industry. C'est celle de faire rentrer la France dans le 21e siècle et en particulier pour les plus jeunes de gagner la bataille chômage de masse. Hi, I'm at Grace Hopper for the first time this year and it's been absolutely amazing. I was on stage yesterday receiving the Social Impact Award, which was just incredible. I want to hire the best marketers in Europe for business to business and business to consumer marketing. I did a video on analytics and I did a video on ROI and the results that I'd been experiencing through video and a few people said they find that interesting. There are many stereotypes when it comes to gender uh, equality. Probably the most common one uh, is the one about the confidence gap. When you were facing the change from the laptop to mobile devices, your business model was in question. I think it was kind of disruptive. So how did you deal with that? So some great stuff happening via video and uh, through storylines, the daily rundown video and our continued investment in the feed, we've seen updates viewed up 60% and again on a very substantial base of roughly 190 billion updates viewed uh, over this, this particular year. So great progress in the feed. If you're going to engage people on a daily basis on the consumer web, there's really two primary ways to do that. One is through content. The other is through communications. And as a result, we have substantially upgraded uh, communications on LinkedIn, overhauling our inbox experience and creating an all-new messaging experience uh, roughly a year and a half ago or so. And we continue to innovate and build on that experience. Uh, we have a contextual overlay. So regardless of where you are on LinkedIn, we can prompt you to message people we believe would be relevant to that particular service. Uh, we recently rolled out active presence. So you can see when the person you want to reach out to is actually on LinkedIn, increasing the likelihood for a real-time conversation. And most recently, we've leveraged AI and machine learning uh, to offer up quick replies. So we suggest a, a response and help people get that conversation started that much faster. Uh, within the context of talent solutions, this has meaningfully moved the needle on one of the most important metrics we track on behalf of value creation for recruiters and hiring managers, and that's our in-mail response rate. And you can see that's up 51% uh, 
as a result of some of these uh, new product introductions. So that's exciting to see as well. Okay, so a lot of engagement, uh, reaccelerating growth in terms of uh, how our members are experiencing LinkedIn. And this increase in engagement is leading to more data flowing through LinkedIn, and that leads to more potential insights. And we're already starting to leverage these insights. In the US, we rolled out our US workforce report, and this provides economic insights that have been picked up by news outlets and publishers, obviously our customers, companies, and members. And we're excited to announce that we're going to be rolling out our first workforce report for the UK market today. As a matter of fact, I think that just happened. Uh, three quick highlights, and you'll be able to see this if you go online. Uh, but one, UK hiring is up 16% year over year. There seems to be a strong rebound following uh, the Brexit vote roughly a year, year and a half ago. And uh, two, we're seeing uh, oil and gas showing recovery, perhaps not surprising given uh, the recent increase in oil prices leading to a 26% year-over-year increase in hires within that segment. And then three, despite some of the Brexit uncertainty, this one may be a little bit counterintuitive, but the UK uh, continues to see net inflows uh, from international markets with regard to talent. Ten of 12 uh, of the nations and regions in the UK seeing positive inflows. So these are the kinds of insights we can provide leveraging LinkedIn data. And it's not just in the US, it's not just in the UK. Uh, we're doing this increasingly on a global basis. Organizations like the World Economic Forum, uh, the World Bank are able to leverage LinkedIn data to help people make better sense of the changes taking place in the global workforce. Okay, so what does all of this mean for you? At the onset of the presentation, talked about three themes that are going to be disrupting the global workforce and uh, the questions that are raised as a result of these disruptions. Now imagine being able to answer some of those fundamental questions. Imagine being able to better navigate the growing uncertainty. Imagine, for example, being able to understand the fastest growing skills within your organization based on where the jobs are increasingly growing, and understanding where any potential gaps may exist, and how that should influence your workforce strategy in terms of recruiting and in terms of learning and development. Imagine being able to benchmark the skills of your organization versus those of your competitors. Imagine being able to identify where in the world there is a surplus of the talent you need to fill those roles and help close any skills gaps that may exist. Imagine being able to identify the precise available pool of talent for any of those roles that you decide you're going to need to fill based on your emerging workforce strategy. Imagine being able to identify how people want to work within your organization once you find exactly the right prospect, independent versus full-time work. And once this workforce strategy is in place and your organization continues to execute upon it, imagine being able to benchmark inflows and outflows of talent from your company to that of your competitors. You won't need to imagine anymore because the next era of talent is here the era of talent intelligence. Thank you.